everybody. My name is Marijke hunter Hisselman. Uh, I'm from the Division for Research Development, and we would like to welcome you to this second session in our um, series on research integrity and ethics. Um, the series, of course, forms part of our information uh, uh, session or information program and our capacity building program, which we launched a few weeks ago. Uh, you would have received the, the, both the programs via email, um, and you can also have a look um, um, check your emails throughout the year be because we will um, again advertise the individual opportunities throughout the year. Some great opportunities coming up. Um, this is, as I said, the second one um, with regards to research integrity and ethics focusing on animal care and use. We will have three short presentations, uh, one by Professor Dirk Balstedt. Welcome, Dirk. He's the chair of the Research Ethics Committee, Animal Care and Use. Then Dr. Essie Spies, um, welcome Essie. She's the Director for Animal Research Facilities and the Principal Veterinarian for Animal Facilities for the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences and the Faculty of Science. And then Mr. Winston Beekes, uh, our go-to person. He is the coordinator for the REC for, for Animal Care and Use. Uh, welcome, Winston. So the session will provide an introduction and an overview of the ethics of animal care and use for scientific purposes and why it's important. It will outline various services offered by the animal facilities within the um, medical and health sciences and um, in the Faculty of Science and then also policies and procedures relevant to the ethics of animal care and use for scientific purposes. And then after we will open the floor for discussion and we really do encourage um, you all to participate, to use this opportunity to discuss and ask questions about the support structures in place um, at Stellenbosch University, uh, particularly for animal research ethics. Thank you very much from my side. Uh, Prof Dirk, over to you. Thank you very much, Marika. Let me see if I can get all the technicalities um, right. Right, is that visible? Yes, we can see. You can just perhaps put it in view mode. There, there you go. OK, right. Off we go. So um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session. And I hope that I can um, help you in this process. The idea is to be um, a constructive discussion here today. So animal ethics approval, uh, what does the process involve? And um, I'm not going to outline exactly all the details, but I want to get some broad perspective across to you here today. So um, all of them must be submitted online. Uh, this is the online link. I think we will supply these discussions in PDF mode so that you could go back and directly click on these. Um, and then the underlying principle of these applications is that um, Stellenbosch University is trying to support researchers to perform animal experiments and not to be an impediment or a delay or to delay research. I think this is a very important basic principle that we would like to bring across and that this be a constructive engagement to support research. Animal um, ethics and animal experimentation is a contentious topic and um, it is not, however, the Animal Ethics Committee which is trying to be an impediment or a problem here. So then um, there is a policy for responsible research conduct um, and this includes then animal ethics and this is um, the purpose of this is to promote and ensure research integrity and the ethical conduct of research and tra and, tra and teaching. Um, this is a, a research um, lecture here, but um, animal ethics also applies to teaching where animals are used in um, practicals. So um, in a very, very simplistic way, I'd like to point out what is ethics? If you were really to delve into this, you would find a huge amount of 
very descriptive terminology, but in a nutshell, ethics is the right thing or good thing to do when the things that we have to do and what we would like to do are in conflict. In other words, um, when we want to work with animals, uh, we think, okay, well, let's just go ahead and do it, whilst in actual fact, there are rules and regulations that we need to adhere to. And those are the ones which are ethics, ethical. Can we do this to these animals um, in these experiments or uh, can we justify them, uh, justify what we're doing? And this is a very, very important concern uh, in animal experimentation. So we need to delve into this in a little further detail. Now, Animals um, are defined as sentient animals when it comes to these applications. Um, and sentient animals are ones that can sense what is going on around them, if we can state that in very, very simplistic terms. Obviously, we've got higher animals like chimpanzees and things like that, that have got very, very much more complex feelings than, say, a laboratory mouse or something like that. But all of these are included in animals that can sense what's going on in their environment and therefore can sense what one might want to be doing with them in animal experiments. They include all mammals, reptiles, amphibians and fishes. And um, the definition then starts getting vague, but there are some higher, higher euro chordates, the details of those if you're working on those marginally, uh, on those marginal groups, uh, one would need to check precisely. But this does not include invertebrates or any microbes. However, invertebrate experiments still need to be considered and registered when it comes to ethical approval. Um, so, um, in looking at an animal ethics um, application, the question is, how is this assessed? And the committee assesses the actual science over and above the animal use in order to form a informed opinion and come to a decision. It's essential that the actual science behind the experiment be investigated. And when uh, an application is filled in, this must be done correctly and in scientific fashion. Uh, a proper scientific motivation has to be given with literature references. We want to see um, that the experiment is justifiable and ethical within the, the scientific field that you might be working in. Then um, the numbers are a very important part of any animal ethics application because if we have huge numbers we need to see what uh, th whether that is justified and on the other hand we want to make sure that insufficient animals are included in a trial so that when eventually an a statistical analysis is done if you were say to treat them with the one or the other thing that that is in actual fact valid that we are not wasting animals by not sufficient rep repetitions. So, so this is something that is carefully examined when we do these um, assessments. Then uh, we assess them in the light of what are called the five freedoms and the three R's, and there are more R's as well. I will come to that in greater detail. And then there are checks that the Animal Ethics Committee does, and those are do, are the requirement uh, are the required permits from various regulatory bodies are they in place? Um, but they are checks. We are not such that we are the ones that will be facilitating these. So um, all animals have the right to five freedoms, and this this is a basic underlying principle under which every application is looked at. And the first four of these are relatively simple and easy to understand, and also easy to understand from the perspective of wanting to permit th these. And those are freedom from hunger and thirst, pain, injury and disease, distress and discomfort. I think all of those are very logical, and I don't think it's a complicated thing to understand that we do not want to expose animals to these problems during animal experimentation. It's the fifth one which often leads to misunderstandings and which leads to unhappiness 
And this is also something that the committee then looks at very carefully. And that is the um, freedom to express behavior that promotes well-being. And you could also say this is the freedom to express natural behavior. Now, that starts becoming complicated because as soon as we've got animals that are in cages, um, this is debatable. And the question is how much space, et cetera, et cetera. And um, to some extent, uh, Dr. Esti Spice will be addressing this with regard to what is um, required for housing animals. Then we get to the R's, the three R's, and those are very carefully assessed for every application. We look at replacement, reduction, refinement, and then there are further R's, but I want to elaborate on this slightly more. Um, but before I do so, I just want to say that one of the tools to assess whether a, an experiment can be permitted or not um, is the so-called harm benefit assessment. So we weigh up all the harmful factors against all the benefiting factors and those then are used to decide whether an experiment is justifiable and or not. So a very careful assessment is made by the committee. So replacement is important. Um, can we replace animals with non-living, say, animal tissue cultures? Often if you want to study, say, the effect on some or other um, organ, can you replace the animal in one which you would do the actual experiment with cells of, say, the liver um, that are in tissue culture? And those things are very, very carefully assessed. And then um, the other is, is the animal model that the uh, proposal wishes to use, is that actually valid for humans? Um, and I can perhaps name an important point here. In COVID-19 testing, um, now vaccines have been tested and initially they were tested on mice, but it is now concluded that um, hamsters are a natural species that is infected with uh, coronaviruses and that in actual fact hamsters are a more appropriate model for vaccines for humans. So again, this needs to be carefully assessed and the committee will assess that specifically then. Then reduction, um, we always look to see whether the number of animals in the experiments are the smallest number that will allow statistically valid deductions. So um, if you propose for huge numbers, you'll have to motivate those properly. On the other hand, if you've got a tiny number and we think that that needs to be increased, we will in actual fact ask you um, to consult a statistician or to use what is called power analysis and to try to thereby come to a, a reasonable conclusion. So um, the idea here is that um, the numbers are very carefully assessed and not um, that excess numbers of animals be used. Then refinement. Um, refinement has, has to do with animal sourcing, care practices, experimental procedures um, to throughout reduce and eliminate physical and physiological stress. So this has to do a lot with housing. ST is also going to be talking about that. Um, but in wild animals, this is a huge factor. For example, if you use trapping of wild animals, then those traps need to be regularly um, inspected so that the animals that are in the traps, there might be live traps from which you want to take a sample, are not unnecessarily stressed by means of the um, the trap that they're then housed in or kept in for a long period of time. So again, very, very careful assessment. Other R's, just so that we can name them, I won't go into detail. Rigor, is the experiment, experiment scientifically sound? Does it have clear aims and objectives? Those are just standard things for any scientific trial. Repetition, this is an important thing. Is this just a repetition of a previous experiment? In other words, you have to, in your literature survey, indicate to us that what you are wanting to do is novel and not just something that the literature has actually worked on before. 
Often we've got South African applications. Yes, those are valid. Then we look at them very carefully. Then, um, very importantly, we demand that researchers take responsible for responsibility for their animal subjects. Um, this is very important. A supervisor takes responsibility. It cannot be uh, handed down to the student and that the student takes all of the responsibility. There has to be ownership of a trial by the senior researcher. Um, and then animals must be treated with respect. Um, we've had problems with chicks, for example, that were used in um, uh, teaching trials, uh, teaching practicals where students uh, were doing all sorts of things to them, and this is just simply not on. So um, bottom line is that there has to be respect for your experimental animals. Then um, regulatory norms um, for experimental animals. Um, all experiments have to be conducted according to uh, SANS, um, the SANS document, which is drawn up by the SABS. For wild animals, uh, permits are required from Cape Nature and on National Parks Board. And then there are special regulations for the top five animals, um, top the big five, as we call them in nature conservation. But also there are additional species which are called top species. And those require very special permission. The university has a TOPS permit, but still every trial needs to be approved um, so that you can go ahead with these things. And then uh, with farmed animals, um, they, the experiments have to conform to the Animal Diseases Act um, and the Meat Safety Act and very often so-called Section 20 permits to control animal diseases and animal vaccinations are required. And, and that is um, something that the committee will check on. Again, they cannot play a role here, but when your application is looked at, um, we will ask whether these um, permits are in place. They can run in parallel, but they will be checked before final permission is given to proceed with a trial. Then um, regulations with regard to GMO animals. I'm referring here specifically to what are called knockout animals. They are often GF GMO. And in that instance, um, that experimentation has to be done within the GMO Act. And a biosafety application to the biosafety committee might have to be done as well. And the same thing applies to um, experiments with uh, animals, say, let's say with TB research, where in actual fact the um, humans that are conducting the trials can be exposed. So there needs to be a safety element in here and those things need to be controlled. So we will look whether the trials are done in, an, in a control environment. So how does a researcher benefit from this process? So number one, you will be conducting research within the SU's policies, policy for responsible research conduct. Um, this is a sort of a difficult statement to make, but as an employee of the university, if you conduct animal experiments, you are by means of your employment contract, contract obliged to conduct research within the, this policy framework. So. Uh, if you do not, you're in actual fact co in contradiction of your um, work conditions and you can find that you could be reprimanded quite severely uh, if you conduct animal experiments without having permission to do so. So this is sort of um, the, the stick part of this um, in that uh, you are forced by means of your employment contract to conduct research on animals, which has been granted approval by the Animal Ethics um, um, Committee. Then um, the Animal Ethics Committee will give you um, advice about uh, generating statistically valid re research results by means of our checking of the numbers. Um, they will also check whether your research is properly structured and can be conducted. And then you will be given an ethics approval number. And this is most probably the most important part of it because you cannot nowadays publish um, animal research uh, results without ethical approval. And um, 
Stellenbosch University gives you an ethics approval number, and this number is then a valid number with a, a traceable project, and this is such that you could submit this to a journal, and they have no reason to not accept this because we are a, um, um, a um, committee which is under the necessary controls. So how does the process work? We meet once a month to assess applications. If you need to have an urgent application um, dealt with, that can be done by, by means of a speeded up process called, called an expedited review. Um, and then the process is administratively driven by Mr. Winston Bierkus, assisted with, by Mr. Aidan Williams. And the whole team is headed by Dr. Nicola Barsdorf, the Director, Research Integrity and Ethics within the Division of Research Development. So um, that's it from my side. Um, I end off with this slide. And um, as Mareka indicated, perhaps we can have a general discussion afterwards, but if there are any burning questions, then I certainly can answer those now. Yeah, yes. Yeah, that's that's question. Question. Yes. Thank you. Thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry to uh, disrupt sorry. anything. Um, I want to thank you for your, your talk. I thought it was extremely helpful, especially for those of us in the humanities. I'm the professor of history, but I had two small questions to ask. And the first one is, I know UCT has stopped all primate use. I wondered what our position as a university is on that. And the second question is, is there, is there an ethical problem that we note with the use of pet, pet horses, beloved pet horses, that are also experimental animals? Because I would have thought that is in many ways a conflict um, within an experiment. And I know they are used at the university. So thank you. Um, right, so as far as I know, um I've been on the committee ever since it started, and we have never They were. That's what I'm studying. That's why I bring it up. They were. We had a yeah, but, but certainly yeah. um, there are no facilities at the moment under the university's auspices for booms, and we have not receive any applications so as far as I'm concerned Stellenbosch University at this point does not have any baboon experiments uh, we don't have any trials that we've approved for say um, you would know that baboons are quite a menace when it comes to say on the peninsula houses and so on so there might be uh, nature conservation type projects um, associated with this but we have not had any applications in that regard, so we have also not had any primate work there. That's um, great. Thank you. So, so none of that. With regard to the horses, I cannot actually tell you, and um, and I think that it may be such that the committee should investigate um, how and whether the horses that are used by the riding club, how that fits into the whole ethics. Oh no, it's not the riding club horses. There are two horses at the sheep facilities um, that I've been told are used for experimentation because otherwise why would they be at the sheep facilities? It's not the riding club horses. None of them are used for any experiments. No, there are no horse experiments that I can tell you categorically. So those might be ones that are running free, but they're not used in any experiments at the moment. And they just belong to a staff member who works at animal physiology or whatever. Yeah, I'm not sure about this, but we can certainly give that some attention. Thank oh. you. But thank you very much. I've, I really want to thank you for your talk. It was extremely useful. Thank you. Thank you. you. Um, we have another question from um, Ms. Maritz. Yes. I believe you're from Animal Sciences. Uh, yes, um, I, I just typed a message for the person who asked the question now. Yes. Um, authors at the sheep facilities aren't using any trials. I beg your pardon? The horses at the sheep facilities yes. are not used uh, in, in any trials at all. Yeah, well, we are unaware of 
any applications with regard to the horses. So I agree we've we have no record of any experimentation. So thank you. OK, thank you, Dirk. Um, I think we thank can you. now move, move over to Esti. Esti, um, would you like to start your presentation? Any other questions we can deal with at the end of the third presentation? Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Winston. Thank you, Prof. I'm just going to share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes, we can definitely see that. Thank you, Esti. All right. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity and to share some more information on our animal research facilities with you, um, as well as a few steps that you need to consider when you are planning an animal study in the future. My name is Dr. Esti Spies. I'm the Director of Animal Research um, and the Principal Veterinarian at the Faculty of Health and Medicine, as well as the Faculty of Science. So I would just like to start off with giving you a bit more information on our, and a bit of background on our animal research facilities. We have the Tigerberg Animal Research Facility, which is located on the medical campus in Tigerberg in Balbul as well as the Science Faculty Small Animal Research Facility, which is in the Microfis um, area in Stellenbosch. Both these facilities are SAVC inspected, audited and registered facilities, and hopefully they will be accredited soon as well. Um, I will talk about that a little bit later. Both these facilities conform with the minimum standards for animal research facilities from the SAVC. They are also conform with the standards from the SANS 10386. They're inspected by the Animal Ethics Committee annually, as well as animal welfare organisations. Both of our facilities have strict access control and only researchers are allowed access to the facilities once their ethical protocols have been approved and only staff and if necessary maintenance workers will be accompanied with staff members are allowed access to our units. There are strict biosecurity controls in all the animal research facilities, ranging from gloves, boot covers, lab coats when working with animals, um, and then strict, obviously strict PPE when going into the BSL3 labs. In all the rooms, in all the facilities housing any animals, there are temperature controls set to the optimal temperature for the specific species. These um, temperatures are recorded daily. And in the Tigerberg Animal Research Facility, these temperatures are linked to an alarm system. And when they drop below or above uh, the optimal temperature for the animals housed in the room, uh, SMS gets sent to our cell phones and we can adapt it accordingly. The lights in all the rooms on both facilities are also on a set to a timer on a 12 hour cycle. So there's a 12 hour light and 12 hour dark cycle, which is perfect for our animals to live in. And they both also have air conditioning set to the right temperatures for, for those specific animals in the room. Then at the Tiger Book Animal Research Facility, we have, I've only been there for five months, but we have an incredibly experienced um, support team at the Tiger Book Animal Research Facility. Anybody who has done any animal research in the past will know Mr. Noel Markgraf, Markgraf, who is very experienced lab animal technician, as well as the facilities manager, and he's been with, uh, with the facility for the past 11 years. Then for the support staff, we have um, staff that has been with the facility for 22 years. So they are highly experienced in, in what they do. They all have a specific animal that they work with um, and very experienced. Then at the Tigerberg Animal Research Facility, we house between 700 and 1,000 animals. Um, mice, rats and rabbits. I can confirm that we do not have any primates and there are no primate studies going on. Um, we are also able to house larger animals in the short term if necessary. 
all of our animals are picked according to the recommended welfare standards and um, sand standards. They all um, have temperature settings, light settings, and they cage specific um, sizes and all their needs. They are strict welfare and health and biosecurity standards in all the rooms with, with all the animals. Um, all our animals are also provided with their specific environmental enrichment. These range from red tunnels for the rats, red houses for the mice. Our rabbits have balls to play with, they have tunnels to hide in, and all the animals are also provided with nesting material. At the Tigerberg Animal Research Facility, I just want to share some of the um, equipment and facilities that we have available. We have two theatres for large animal work. Um, each of these theatres have two anaesthetic um, machines with ventilators and monitors to monitor vital signs. And we also have multiple procedure rooms for small animal work with anesthetic machines, laminar flow cabinets, and various other equipment that um, researchers might need. We also have an animal biosafety level three lab. Um, we are able to house 96 experimental cages and we have 56 breeding cages on two blowers and racks. So these are individually ventilated cages. And um, there's also a procedure room for performing procedures in two biosafety cabinets and there's homogenizers, incubator and other equipment that research is working in a BSL3 lab might need. And there's also a cage changing room with two biosafety cabinets to keep the, um, our staff safe and an infection room which um, with the aerosolizer to perform infections and our animal BSL3 lab is obviously um, built according to standard and is DALID um, compliant. Then the Stellenbosch Animal Research Facility or the Faculty of Science Research Facility is a much smaller facility. No breeding or stock animals are kept in the Stellenbosch Animal Research Facility and the animals will only be issued if um, required by researchers after ethical protocol has been approved by the ethics committee. There are also separate rooms for the mice and the rats and the rabbits that can be housed there. And there's a small procedure room with an anesthetic machine, a biosafety cabinet and a lab and a flow cabinet as well for any procedures that needs to be performed. Then I thought I would just give you a guide if you are planning any animal work in the future, just a few steps that one needs to follow and, and some timelines. So first I'll go into some detail um, on each step a, a little bit later, but you know, you need to plan way ahead if you want things to run smoothly. So contact the animal facility six months to a year before you plan on starting with your animal study. Talk to them and contact them and just have a, a discuss, informal discussion before you even apply for your ethics. After that, in your discussion, you can talk about budget, calendar, applying for your ethics three to six months before you want to start. Then we'll talk about SABC authorization and how to, how and when to order your animals before you start the study. So this is a very important point, is to communicate with your animal facility. Discuss with them if they have space, if they, they have the animals that you need. Do they have the strains that you need? Will you need to import strains? Can they breed the strains for you? Or do you need to acquire them from a different animal facility? Do they have the equipment that you need for your specific project? You can discuss the welfare and health issues that you might have with your project. And they can also assist you with having the right monitoring and anesthetic sheets. You can also discuss the procedures that you will be performing. Do you feel confident and um, with performing these procedures or are the staff available and are they able to assist you with the procedures that you need to perform for your animal study? It's a good, also a good opportunity to discuss budget and the calendar. Discussing your budget is very important. Um, this is, it needs to be done before your study commences so you can make sure that you have enough funds to complete the study. It's also good to discuss your budget to, in order to manage expectations and to avoid unpleasant surprises at the end. Uh, 
costs are fixed, fair, accurate, and transparent. And if anybody has any questions or concerns, they're more than welcome to discuss the costs of our animal facility with me. Our costs are also comparable with most other major animal research facilities. I'm not going to go into too much detail about costs, but um, a, a lot of researchers often question you know, the costs of a mouse or of an animal or of a research project. And I just wanted to try and show what goes into actually raising and, and producing an animal for a project. It's not only food and water. There are a lot of things that goes into, um, into breeding these animals and a lot of things that contribute to the costs. After discussing with the animal facility, you can apply for your ethics. So as Prof Balstead and um, Winston will discuss as well, I'm not going to go into too much detail. Our ethics application is an online application. Um, on the website, we have monthly dates that we set and feedback can usually be given within two weeks. If you need any more information, you can um, look at the website or con to contact Winston. So let's talk a bit about the SABC authorization. According to the Veterinary and Paraveterinary Professions Act, 19 of 1982, only registered veterinary and paraveterinary professions, which are veterinarians, vet nurses, lab animal technicians, vet techs, animal health technicians, are allowed to practice any veterinary or paraveterinary procedures. However, according to Rule 23C, the council will give individuals authorization to perform animal procedures if they need to. So the difference between registered and authorized, SABC registered and SABC authorized, is if you are registered, you are a veterinary or paraveterinary profession, where if you are authorized, you receive authorization to perform a veterinary or paraveterinary profession's procedures. So SABC authorization is not a new thing. It was just not enforced in the past. A lot of people will come, will ask me, what is this new thing about SABC authorization? It's not new. Um, it was just not enforced in the past. So SABC authorization, it is in the best interest of the animal welfare. It's the best interest of research ethics, and it's in the best interest of project results and research results. Um, you know, some researchers are using scheduled medication, and this needs to be regulated. All veterinary and paraveterinary procedures require authorization. Um, however, you do not need authorization to perform a husbandry, for example, feeding and cleaning and, um, of cages, but I do strongly recommend that training is still necessary to perform these functions. Um, with SABC authorization, the researchers and the students need to be competent in the correct new and modern techniques and procedures when using animals. And I know that SABC authorization can be quite a long and frustrating task and a lot of documents are required, but there is a little bit of hope. I have applied for SABC facility accreditation recently. Um, uh, facilities that are accredited with the South African Veterinary Council will have the applications reviewed more often. At the moment, applications are only reviewed three times a year. At the moment, supervisor reports need to be submitted every six months. If a facility is accredited, it will only have to be done every year. There are also reduced rates for applications and quicker turnaround times and feedback on applications. So that will be great news. So to acquire SABC authorization, what we do is we need to have theoretical and practical training for researchers and students that are planning animal studies. So all researchers and students will be trained on all the legal, the regulatory, and the ethical requirements when working with animals. This is done in a presentation or a PowerPoint um, format. And they will also receive training on the correct husbandry and care for the specific species that they will be working on. There's also a, a practical training component 
where candidates will need to be taught and demonstrated the correct techniques to use when performing procedures. And after they feel confident and comfortable with handling and doing procedures on the animals, we will then do a competency where I will assess if they are competent enough to um, to do to perform procedures so that they will be able to do it in their research projects. Once competency has been proved, it is signed off by the vet and we send this all in uh, to the SAVC. And once it's approved, the candidate is then allowed to perform procedures on animals. So I put the dates there for the submission for the deadlines for um, SAVC authorization. If there is anybody that is planning on doing animal studies in this year, please take note of those dates and you can contact me anytime if you require SAV authorization throughout the year. I just also want to add that SAVC authorization is required for performing any procedures on animals. However, if there are procedures that candidates or researchers or students don't feel comfortable with performing, then they don't have to. The staff at the Tigerberg Animal Research Facility are here to assist students and researchers with procedures. Um, there are procedures that some researchers don't want to perform and we completely understand that and we are there to assist and help with that. After ethics uh, approval or oh, ethics submission, there is a form. It's for the request for use form. This form is being filled in. Just it's just to let the facility know that you are planning a study, what animals you need, when do you need them, and it just helps us to um, prepare and to organize and to coordinate all the different um, pr um, projects that are running at the facility at the moment, and to just help and support where we can. This is very important, is to plan your calendar. This helps the staff and the researchers with accurate planning of the study. There are multiple studies at the same time going on um, and that we need to coordinate our time, coordinate the space and plan everything accordingly. There is limited equipment. There are only a few biosafety cabinets. There are only a few anesthetic machines. So we need to know which days, which researchers are planning on performing certain procedures so that we can let all the other researchers know that the space or the equipment won't be available. We also have limited staff available to help with certain procedures. For example, if you need us to assist with something, we need to plan this ahead of time and let the other researchers know as well. Then there are things like weekends and public holidays and Christmases. We need to plan around that. And then at the animal facility, we have scheduled maintenance and servicing of our equipment, our autoclaves, our anesthetic machines. And this also needs to be coordinated and it also needs to be included in planning your research projects. Then a very important point as well is when you are planning an animal study, keep in mind that once we start breeding, the animals have a three week gestation period and thereafter weaning is only between three and four weeks. So therefore, if you are planning an animal study, know that it might take between six to eight weeks. So from we start the breeding or setting the breeding pairs up until you will receive your animals. If you are receiving them at four weeks age, most researchers only want them at seven or eight or nine weeks. That makes the waiting period even longer. And this also depends on what strain are you using and are you only using males or are you only using females? For example, some strains produce very small litters and that is why it's important to dis discuss this with your animal research facility. This is just an example of a calendar. It's very small. I don't know if you can see it, but it just sort of says this is the days that we are starting our project. This is the period of acclimatization to get the animals used to us and to get the animals used to new smells and new people and new sounds and new facilities if they are moved from Tigerberg to Stellenbosch. And then which days you will require our assistance, which days you will need to book out the anesthetic machines or the biosafety cabinets. And so that is just an example of a, a calendar. Yes, and that's it. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I hope this helped you with, um, with knowing how to plan animal study better in the future and also give you a little bit of a, an idea of what facilities we have available um, when it comes to animal research. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. for that wonderful presentation. Colleagues, um, 
Uh, shall we dive right into my presentation and at the end ask questions? Open the session up for questions. I think so. Uh, I don't see any objections to that. So let me just open up my slides. Okay, so is my slides displaying in view mode? Oh, <clears throat> yes or no? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, good afternoon, colleagues, um, and welcome again to our session uh, 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 for us talking about the Research Ethics Committee, Animal Care and Use, or broadly speaking, Animal Ethics at Stellenbosch University. So I'm Winston Beekes. Many of you might know me um, from previous uh, interactions, or if not, future, definitely future interactions, if you um, will subject animals to research, teaching or testing activities at the university. Let's move to the next slide. Um, okay, so the Research Ethics Committee, Animal Can Use, that's the proper name or the, the name uh, registered within the institution. So we, in short, refer to it as the REC ACU. And uh, this committee uh, forms part of a number of committees that functions within the uh, policy for responsible um, research conduct. Um, and under that policy, we are constituted according to the South African national standard in terms of membership um, and function and how we operate, but also um, with regard to membership um, uh, under the Department of Health guidelines, 2015 guidelines. So this is a particular interesting group of people that I'm very fortunate to work with. And over a number of years, we've we've had uh, ups and downs, ironed out some things within the committee in terms of function and, and, and so on. So these are really um, uh, uh, wonderful people to work with. So, a few years or in 1995, NASA did some uh, experiments uh, subjecting spiders to a variety of drugs, uh, I think in fashion drugs at that time. Um, and we can clearly see uh, that caffeine, the coffee that we consume so much of, um, caused quite a lot of uh, disorientation with the spider. So within the ethics cluster, I think we are also uh, if we had to spin webs, we would definitely uh, suffer the same fate as the spider as a result of our coffee intake. And so also the members of the committee, as they are quite busy um, with their reviews and uh, providing feedback to applicants. So the policy again, um, so I will only highlight the aspects of the policy that is really gotten a uh, you know, uh, is really relatable to animal ethics um, in terms of, of what we do with the animals. So obviously the whole policy is important, but certain aspects stand out for the Animal Ethics Committee. And firstly, uh, transparency. So the review process is a transparent process. How researchers use animals should be a transparent process. We report to the National Health Research Ethics Council in terms of what applications we reviewed, uh, the number of applications, the number of animals, the variety in animal species that we approved. What is also important is mutual respect and respect for animals. Uh, unlike humans, animals cannot say no. They can't um, provide consent or uh, agree to take part in a study. And for that reason, we need to treat them with respect in terms of how we handle them um, and how we work with the animals. Thirdly, responsibility. Um, animal ethics is not only the responsibility of the Animal Ethics Committee. It's not only the responsibility for people involved with animal work, but it is an institutional responsibility in terms of making sure that our animals are not um, 
um, abused, are not uh, ill-treated in, 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 the, in the conduct of, of research projects. So with that said, um, we, SU and of, of course the ethics committees, therefore of the view that good science assumes ethical accountability. And um, if you have not had a chance to uh, go through the, the ethics policy, uh, please make time. I, I know it might be a, uh, not a uh, Saturday morning read, but focus on those aspects of the policy that's applicable to you. And if you're doing animal work, focus on that section um, that deals with animal work. As I said earlier, um, this committee consists of a number of people, and these people are uh, on the committee in various categories as uh, put in the South African National Standard for the Care and Use of Animals. We've got uh, category A, disqualified veterinarians. We've got three veterinarians on our committee. Of, yeah, soon there will be four um, veterinarians, of which ST is one of the veterinarians. Um, category D refers to committee members that are academics with substantial experience in animal work. Uh, we have a whole number of, of, of um, um, committee members in category uh, B. Then animal welfare organization is the NSPCA or the National SPCA who represents, uh, who have two representatives on the committee. Um, we have a lay person on the committee, which is Professor Sonia Maton, who represents the community. And then we've got other non-affiliated uh, members from the NSPCA um, and uh, not the NSPCA, but Cape Nature. Um, and then my colleagues uh, in the ethics office who serves um, ex officio on the committee. A wonderful bunch of people and um, very, very knowledgeable uh, in terms of, of animal work. OK, so so this is our animal Bible, sort of, if you want to refer to it uh, like that. It's the South African National Standard uh, that is published by the SAPS. A new version has just been published um, in the beginning of this year, during, I think it was January or February. Um, and is available uh, from the SABS. So Stellenbosch University, or, or our office, the Division for Research Development, is in process of purchasing a license to allow our users um, and clients to access this document um, in terms of, of the conditions of the license. Um, once that has been concluded, uh, the link to the document will be put on our website, a copy in the library, um, and people can then uh, access it via those two, two options. I'm not going to uh, touch on the on the um, definition of an animal. I think Dirk uh, explained that quite well. Uh, what is important though is to note that um, live animals require animal ethics, a formal process of approval. Um, when you are using animal tissue that was obtained from animals that already was killed under an approved ethics project or animals that were routinely killed as, as part of culling or um, animals that um, you um, get samples from that was killed at an abattoir. Those type of, of projects do not require official ethics approval but this committee requires you to inform us or to notify us that you are indeed um, working with animal uh, tissue uh, obtained from uh, dead animals so that we can confirm the source of the material so that we are sure the animal material that you used were indeed uh, killed in an ethical manner. Um, I'm also not going to touch on the three R's much. Dirk has already spoken about that. So replacement, if you can replace the live animal model with the non-animal uh, uh, model, uh, you can do so. Um, and if you can't, you need to justify why you need to use a live animal. That is, uh, Labos is a member of our ethics committee, and that was part of one of our inspections at an animal facility. Um, 
Deduction, as Dirk said, if you can use seven animals, don't use 100. Justify why uh, you need to use um, the proposed number uh, that you put to the committee, um, and they will then review that. Refinement in terms of procedures, especially when you uh, subject animals to um, procedures that could cause uh, significant harm or lasting harm, you need to refine your procedures in such a way that you mitigate those risks and harms so that the animal do not unnecessarily uh, suffer. And this is what the committee will definitely focus on. There is a fourth R as published in the new South African National Standard that deals with responsibility um, and it unpacks responsibility in terms of the researcher, the ethics committee and the institution. And it is it is quite interesting to see how the standard um, um, assigns the responsibility in terms of animal work over those three categories. So the important aspect, applying for ethics approval. So this is a process uh, and any process will at some point have some hurdles. Um, so we have an applica online application system with an application form, various application forms, depending on what you aim to submit to the committee. Um, there is a office um, that deals uh, with the administrative function of the committee and that office is within the uh, Research Integrity and Ethics Office and I'm responsible for, for the administration side of this committee. So um, there are uh, meetings and every meeting has a cutoff date for the agenda and those dates are published on our website. Uh, the committee usually met every six weeks, but now we meet once a month uh, as a result of uh, the increase of applications to the committee. And we will not have a meeting in June, as was directed by the senior management of the institution. No committee meetings in June so that our uh, valued members can take a break um, and, and go away a bit. I don't know where, but they can take a break. Um, then, of course, there are, as we heard, under the ethics policy, a number of ethics uh, committees or research ethics committees. And sometimes, not all the time, sometimes there might be cases where you would need uh, approval from more than one of these committees or even three. Uh, and that would be extremely rare that you would need approval from three. But on our website, we've got an infographic um, document that you can access that will explain uh, the, the four ethics committees and um, what each of them do or their scope. But in essence, if you need to obtain approval from both or two committees, these uh, applications can run in parallel and um, the committees uh, coordinators will obviously be in contact with one another to flag that this application is serving at my committee and um, please take note that it will serve at yours um, and we will try to uh, limit the turnaround time or shorten the turnaround time in terms of having two separate ethics application processes that you need to follow. Um, as Dirk has already provided you with a link, there's the link for the application system. Fortunately for us, we have an ethics help desk um, and this ethics help desk is very, very, very um, functional um, and we really um, value this ethics help desk and it's managed by my learned colleague, Mr. Aidan Williams. So if you have any questions related to the application system in terms of access and how to submit uh, and request signatures, you are more than welcome to email Mr. Aidan Williams, make an appointment um, and have a chat with him. If there's more substantial um, aspects relating to the review part of it, you are more than welcome to contact me. Um, our website uh, address is listed below, um, so you are more than welcome to access the website for further information pertaining to the ethics application process. What is also very important to note is that with any uh, approval process, there is a requirement to make sure that what has been approved is actually uh, the work that's being conducted. Uh, and for that reason, 
this committee has a post approval monitoring system whereby we will from time to time and our focus will uh, be on high risk studies. Um, identify a few studies and physically go to the laboratory to check that what has been approved is actually being conducted. Um, over the 29 uh, when did COVID start, but over the COVID period, we weren't able to visit uh, too many or to conduct too many post approval monitoring. But now with a relaxed system, we will definitely going forward uh, schedule more post approval monitoring visits um, to ensure that uh, we um, just keep abreast with what we've been approving. Um, in my last slide, uh, I, I try to summarize the important aspects that you should know regarding this uh, ethics application process. Uh, number one, uh, submit your application on time. Um, there are dates, cutoff dates and meeting dates. Make sure you understand when the cutoff date for the agendas are. Um, and remember that this is a process. Uh, if you submit on the first of the month, you won't get feedback uh, on the second. So discuss your application with your supervisor before final submission. That is very important. Um, if you are unsure, if you need assistance, um, please contact our office um, via sending us an email. And if uh, in, in future, you are more than welcome to make an appointment and, and come to our office. Um, we are there to assist you. And if I don't know the answer, I might very well know who to contact to, to aid you in, in what you need to find out. Spelling and language checks is very important. It, it might sound mundane or over uh, overkill, but if we cannot understand what you're saying in your application, it is very difficult for us to deduce what you want to do. Um, visit the ACU website. As I said, the dates, get to know the system. Uh, even if you're not ready to submit your application, go online, see how it works, contact the help desk, Make sure that you are well familiar with it at the time, so that at the time you need to submit an application, you don't have to struggle with unfamiliar systems. Um, the SANS document, very important, um, and we are working very hard to get uh, the new version at the university so that you can access the document. Um, but this document outlines the four R's, replace, reduce, refine, and responsibility. And that forms the basis of, of the ethics review. Um, and you need to, to focus on that in terms of, of um, putting together your application. Um, what I've recently found out is that uh, it is not a good idea to wait six months before you follow up. Follow up if after two weeks you have not received any feedback from this office, please contact us via email. Um, and if that email is not answered, um, go up in the chain, see who else you can contact, contact the help desk, contact my boss, contact the senior director, but follow up um, as soon as you don't get feedback. Don't follow up a day after the meeting though, but you can follow up, uh, but don't wait six months. That will just cause havoc. And then lastly, don't be stressed out about the process. Um, uh, we are all, the whole committee, myself and the Office for, for Research Integrity and Ethics are here to provide a service and to aid you to get your research projects going, uh, but to make sure that it is uh, conducted within an ethical manner. Those, those are my slides. Uh, I think we can now open the floor um, for questions. Any questions? If not, well then we did a really good job. Dirk, any last words? Esti, it seems, oh, there. We have Dr. Shishi, who's also a member of the Ethics Committee. Thank Afternoon, you, Winston. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you to all the speakers, very informative information but I was hoping at least one person would comment on the UCT course. 
um, in terms of its importance either for ethics or SAVC um, authorization? Okay, so um, I'll ask Esti to come in here as well, but um, thank you for that, Bali. Um, we, the, the UCT campus or the University of Cape Town do have a, uh, an ethics course uh, that is open to uh, anybody involved in re annual research. Um, and some of our students have uh, done that course. I myself has, has completed that course at UCT. Um, and um, yes, it is it is important. But Isti, do we have uh, something similar on our side already or not yet? Hi, hi, Bali. Thank you, Winston. Um, the UCT course is a very good course. Um, I myself also completed the course last year. It goes into a lot of detail, very in-depth on um, the lab animal science in general. So they cover legalities, ethical issues, um, both rats and mice, procedures, husbandry, basic anatomy. So it's a very in-detailed course. So although this course is accredited by the South African Veterinary Council, if you complete this course, you do not automatically receive South African Veterinary Council authorization. So SAVC authorization still needs to be um, applied for. Competency still needs to be proved and the vet, which is myself, still needs to see that you are competent to perform procedures and needs to be signed off and then we submit the application. Um, so what we are doing now is um, we will have short training courses or training sessions before a month or so before the cutoffs for submission for the SABC authorizations. And in those meetings, in those sessions, we will have, um, we will cover ethics, um, legal requirements, basic husbandry and procedures that a researcher or student will be performing during their specific study. We won't focus on the broader science of lab, um, lab animal science. We will only be focusing on only those procedures and only the, the um, information that you need for your particular study and only the procedures that have been approved in your ethical protocol. So how it will work is we will, um, I will send out the dates um, and we will do the uh, theory presentations in the morning. And if you are only, for example, performing welfare monitoring and restraint and handling and weighing of your animals, we will do that on the, on the first day. If there are other procedures that were approved in your ethical protocol that you need training on, that will occur during the rest of the week. And once a researcher or a student feels comfortable and confident in performing a procedure, we will then on the last day, which will be the Friday, I will do the competency assessment. And once we, the, we see that the person is competent, we will submit all the documentation to the SAVC to be authorized. So the difference between the two is the, it's the um, UCT is a course. Uh, I think it's two days practical. There are 38 hours of theory that you need to work through. And although you get a certificate at the end of it, in, and CPD points, if you are authorized or registered with the council, you do not automatically receive SABC authorization from that. That you will only be able to do through us or through me at the University of Stellenbosch. But the course at UCT is highly recommended. It's very valuable, very informative. It's also good to network with other universities and other researchers, see what they are doing. The course starts on, the next course is on the 4th of April. Um, and I can share a link with you if you want. I can send you more information on that. I think the cost for the course starting now on the 4th of April is 13,000 Rand. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Bali, does um, it answer your question? <laughs> um, partly it does. I just wanted to make sure that it's neither a requirement for ethics application or for the SAVC authorization. No, it's not a requirement for SABC authorization and it's also not a requirement for um, yeah, animal ethics approval. Um, but it is recommended if you are going to be working with animals, the more exposure you get, the more knowledge you get, the more comfortable you get with them. It's also part of one of the R's um, of refinement. So it is recommended, but it is not a requirement. Thank you.
Thank you, um, Esti. Um, we have Professor Samson. Hi, Sam, you can go ahead. Uh, hi, Winston and team. Uh, thanks for the presentations today. That was really useful. Just a very quick one. I know someone did touch on it um, in terms of Section 20 applications because quite a bit of our work um, ha needs this. So do you have any words of advice or, or anything on that? Yes, so uh, the sooner you, you start with the application to the department, the better. Um, obviously, we as the Ethics Committee or the institution cannot, uh, we are not privy or part of that process as it is an external process. Um, if need be, um, you can contact me with regard to finding out where you need to send the application for Section 20. Um, but the Animal Ethics Committee will uh, add a condition to your approval to state that your project is approved subject to you obtaining that um, a permit because it is a, a, a regulatory requirement to do work under uh, Section 20. Uh, Dirk, do you want to add something? Yeah, I can just say that the Section 20 um, issuing of permits has been up and down. Um, we have tried to streamline that, this process by also uh, contacting people at the Department of Agriculture. Um, it's an ongoing process and we try to assist Stellenbosch um, researchers, of course, but it is um, not always uniformly applied. Some find that their Section 20 applications go through very quickly, others it's a major problem. So um, as uh, Winston quite correctly indicates, start that process early, earlier than actually applying to the Animal Ethics Committee because I think our process is streamlined and works efficiently. Thanks to Winston, who really runs a tight shop. So um, yes, Section 20s are one of our headaches. Um, I, I perhaps, um, yes, any any more question about this, questions about the Section 20s? I see comments about SAPRA applications. I think that, um, again, the ethics, Animal Ethics Committee cannot um, assist you directly, but I think that with some of these things, um, SAPRA is, of course, the medicines um, or, or approval of medications, and there, there should certainly be a channel via the medical faculty, which I'm unaware of because I'm not in medical sciences, but um, as Winston indicates, contact him, he might be able to put you in touch with someone. Any other questions? I would like to make a few comments still. I think you can go ahead, Dirk. Uh, yeah, um, Winston, one, one of the things that Winston mentioned was that you should follow up with regard to your application. Now, we find that sometimes researchers fill in their applications on the online system, but then they don't press the submit button. And I think that's the that's the thing that Winston is actually referring to. So we don't know whether you've finished your application and we can't prod you. So check on that score. That's, I think, why Winston says check whether it's been submitted so that we can make sure that it is on the system. So that's that's just a relatively minor point. But sometimes the system um, might have these glitches. So then um, I, I just want to make one thing clear here and that is that you know it might sound as though the university is ethically concerned about animals and for that reason that's why it's installed this committee sure that is the case but there's one other important aspect and that is that the animal ethics um, committee's decisions are in actual fact um, subject to being reported to the National Department of Health to the NHREC the National Health Research Ethics Councils and we are also audited. So this is not a process which is one where the university can just do as it wishes. This is a regulated process once again, and it's regulated by law. So this has become a requirement that the university adheres to these conditions. And, and so the whole process is being tightened up a lot more. Previously, there was none of this. I'm talking you know, about 30, 40 years ago, but it's 
very apparent that you cannot work on animals without correct approval, and this is part of that process. So um, we hope that this will help you in your applications. And as Winston and, and SD and I have indicated, um, the Animal Ethics Committee and the whole um, um, team are there to assist you as part of the research assistance at Stellenbosch University. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you, colleagues. Um, it was a pleasure speaking to you and hopefully you will send us some email uh, emails asking us for further advice or pop in when we are allowed to pop into the office. And uh, thank you for making sure that uh, you're working uh, in a humane manner with our animals.